Okay. Sorry. Now it's on. <laughs> okay. Mike's back on. Um, so we're going to talk about what roses are, and most of them are quite similar in the way they function. So if we take a um, rose that hasn't been pruned for a while, so most modern roses that we sell uh, bloom on new growth. So a new stem comes up, it blooms, and then after it blooms, it makes a little uh, rose hip. Some roses, this falls off before it makes a rose hip. This one is making a rose hip. So if you want to get to them, for them to bloom more frequently, uh, the most important thing to do on roses, if they don't do it themselves, is to deadhead them. Just take off all these rose hips, and then that allows them to make more flowers again. Um, most roses grow between three and six foot tall. So there are what we call climbing roses, and those roses tend to make stems instead of you know three to six foot tall they'll make stems six to twelve or even fourteen foot long and so we use those as climbers and trail them on fences some of them grow upright most of them can trail sideways um, and the ones that are shorter we use as bushes generally so and here's one here white matey land that we actually use as a ground cover so it tends to trail on the ground now most roses will bloom on the same stem about on average six weeks after you cut off the old flower. So here we have, this is a new flower bud forming here. So on average throughout the year it's about every six weeks. Now it is faster in the summer, the hotter the weather is, the quicker they repeat. So in the summertime they say it's four weeks in the winter about eight or ten weeks so it slows down when the weather gets cold now the other thing to know about roses is, is the longer it takes from them to make a flower use in the cooler the weather usually the longer the stem and the bigger the flower so in the summertime because they're blooming very quickly uh, due to the heat the flowers are generally smaller um, and in these, you know, you get your best flowers, say, late, mid to late spring. That's when you have wonderful flowers. Although, if fall is cool, you know, this fall may turn out to be quite cool. I've had some of the biggest roses on my plants around Christmas time. Now here, we don't have a killing frost most years. I mean, out of all the years I've been growing roses. So I started growing roses uh, professionally and at my home around 1980. And um, we had a few killing frosts in the late 80s that would actually make the roses drop their leaves that alongside with uh, winds that would strip the leaves off and they'd put them to sleep uh, sometime in the winter. But generally, uh, most years, they bloom all the way through winter. So, so they can bloom any time of the year. Now... In your garden, the majority of roses are planted, you know, most books will tell you three feet apart. So the center of one rose to the center of the next rose, three feet, and that's good room for them. There's no rules to that. So I've done them closer, I've done them farther. The farther apart you put roses, the fewer bugs and diseases travel from plant to plant. So you have uh, less problems with bugs and diseases. Of course, if you put them all together, then when you do treat for bugs or diseases, it's easier to treat them all at once. So most people have rose gardens where all the roses are, you know, side by side. But we have noticed that if you have isolated roses in your garden, one here and maybe one 50 foot away, they rarely get any problems or they have much fewer problems than roses that are side by side. The diseases and the bugs tend to move quickly from plant to plant if they're close together so okay now let's main thing we'll do this morning well one thing i want to do is make sure you know how to make sure that bare root roses don't scare you because a lot of people have had bad luck with 
bare root roses, especially if they don't buy them from us because in most stores they don't take care of the bare roses. So the bare roses in most stores that come in a package with wet something around the roots uh, and nobody takes care of them. And if they're not watered when they get dry, their, you know, their chances of survival aren't very good. Uh, at our store, we still do it the old fashioned way. We have bins out there in our display area filled with wet sawdust and uh, we'll hold them in there until you, you, you pick them up or select them. Um, now, we do take special orders in the fall. So from now until the roses come, we'll, we'll take special orders. If you want to pre-order a rose, uh, we will pull it aside when they come in, bag them up and have your name on the bag and ready to be picked up at that time. Do know, though, that roses are you know, quite perishable. In, in fact, when we get them in winter, they're not really fully dormant here because we're not cold enough. So they start growing within a couple of weeks, they've got some leaves coming out. So we'd like to see any bare rose be planted within a few weeks of when you pick it up. Although I have, you know, we sometimes have roses sitting around in bags to be picked up for a couple months and they're still okay, but they're not perfect. They're not as nice as they would have been if they were done sooner. So bare roses, when we get them, are basically some nice stems. So let's uh, let's make the root system first. So the roots on roses, most of the roses we get are grafted. So there's a root stock with roots on the bottom of it. And I'll try to draw this fairly close to uh, full size so we'll get them in with roots coming down like that um, root stock and then they're grafted usually on the side of the root stock and then on the top we'll have growing off this area hopefully um, at least three stems or canes as we call them. So a grade number one rose, which we prefer, has at least three canes on it that there are at least as thick as a pencil. Three eighths inch diameter. Um, the roses that are planted into these pots usually aren't grade one. So you can, the, the bare roses, you can get bigger roses than you would normally if you bought them in a pot although you know this is now a year older than the bare roots would be so it's got some size it grew some nice canes but when this was uh, purchased by the this original grower i think it had two uh, decent stems on it and now it's about it and it grew the rest during the year so if you get a and usually when we get bare roses i would say most the majority of them have more than three stems uh, five is what we like to see at least, and some have even more than that. So, now, when we get them, they're usually a little bit longer. We like to cut them shorter. So the problems we have when growing them, so when you put them in the ground, the normal soil level on these would be around around here. Now, roses aren't real picky about the soil level. If you lived in Minnesota, you'd be planting the same rose this deep. So in Minnesota, what happens is that where the graft is, you know, everything below here is not the same rose. From here on up, it's the rose you want. If this is above ground in Minnesota in the wintertime, the danger of frost can kill this whole area off. The roots are the only thing left, and they'll send up suckers that don't have the right flower. So if you're in an area where it can freeze really badly, you bury your roses way deep in the ground. The ground is an insulator, keeps this area alive. So back in the 80s, when I first started growing roses, I go, okay, the same rose we grow in California like this, they grow in Minnesota like this. What happens if we do this? Yeah. It was fine. They look great. No problems at all. So. <laughs> 
So there's no rules here. You can plant them deep and they'll be just fine. They just grew out of here and they rooted out of here, which roses do, yes. <clears throat> Yeah. So the roots, so the rootstock that you use by growers in California is called Dr. Huey. If now if you're in Florida, they use a different rootstock. That, they use the rootstock that's best for the soils found in the local growing area, which in California, in the clay soils and near Fresno, where they grow the roses, uh, Dr. Huey works best. So Dr. Huey is a climbing rose. It's got no thorns, which is nice for the rose growers. They, what they do to grow these roses is they'll take a piece of cane of Dr. Huey and stick it in the ground in January, let it grow until June, cut off the top and splice in one uh, rose bud from the rose that they want. And then that grows out. And then a year and a half later, they harvest the rose. So that's how they do these. In Florida, they use uh, polyantha roses, which they say take the sandy soils better or less nematode, um, you know, sandy soils, you get a lot of nematodes, so they have to use something different. So if you buy a rose that was grown in Florida, it'll have a different rootstock and perhaps different kind of suckers. But if Dr. Huey sends out shoots, which it can, uh, they'll grow long the first year, they'll bloom beautiful red flowers, uh, dark red flowers the second year, but they don't repeat, they only have the one bloom a year. But they use Dr. Huey for rose trunks on tree roses. Uh, and they use it for most of the um, grafted roses here. Now, roses can, can also be grown on their own roots. So some roses are really good. You just take a stem of theirs and put them in the soil, and they grow roots. And so those are called the own root roses. So there's grafted roses and own root roses. Some roses aren't very good at making roots. So they have, they still graft a lot of them that don't grow roots and aren't very vigorous on their own roots. But a lot of roses now are done that way. And people who live in the frost prone areas would rather have the own root roses because if the entire thing freezes, what grows back from the roots is the same rose. So most, you know, a lot of roses now, uh, about, I would say a third of all the roses we carry are offered on their own roots. But again, some just don't do well on their own roots, so we don't grow them or we don't have them. Okay, so this is the original level. So you can bury them deep. The deeper you bury them, the more likely they are to succeed. So the problems we have here is when we plant the roses in December, January or so, bare root, for about two weeks, these roots need to recover to get fully functional. These stems can dry up. So rose stems, even though they're covered in wax, they're not totally waterproof and they lose moisture. Especially if we have, you know, this wasn't the case last year or earlier this year. We had, it just was storm after storm. It was real humid. The entire year has been humid. Uh, we might have our first true Santa Ana tomorrow or tonight. But this whole year, the air has been very humid. So we haven't had any trouble with the roses at all. But if we have a Santa Ana when the roses, we plant the rose and the stems are exposed, they will shrivel. So what we, so back when I first started growing roses, the rule was you planted them at this level, you make everything around them muddy and slop the mud and cover them up. So you take the muddy dirt and just pile it up like this for the first week or two until you saw the new growth start out the, the canes and then you can wash this off or really you can leave it. It doesn't hurt the rose at all to do that. So make sure it's dirt. Uh, our, our potting soils can work, but the main thing is do not use compost to cover it up. I, I tried that one year because I didn't know any better back in the uh, 90s I did that and what happens is compost eats up every single new leaf that tries to grow so the role of compost in nature is to consume plant material so the leaves started to grow and the compost ate them up you see these 
barely skeletons of leaves coming out of the stem. So compost is the worst thing you can do to cover this up. It'll keep it moist, but it'll eat up all the leaves. Plus, compost can get pretty warm inside, too. But uh, just regular dirt is fine. And if you don't have that much dirt, what the LA Times promoted once is you get newspaper uh, and make a cone around your rows with newspaper and then just fill pop dirt down the middle of that cone. So if the air is dry, then that's what we do until they sprout. Usually they sprout within two weeks. Usually they're sprouting when you buy them, so. Okay, and then once they're well on their way, then you can knock this cone of dirt down. Uh, if you're using um, hoses, you can make a little berm around them to fill with water, or if you have sprinklers, it's not essential. Um, now, the soil of roses, you know, roses don't really care about soil quality that much. Clay, sand, even almost shale type soils, they'll grow in. Um, now, they grow faster, and they grow longer stems and taller if they're in sand. So know that. So what we know is that the forest rose growers that grow for the forest trade, they want biggest flowers, longest stems. They're all in sand. So you put a rose in sand. We had one customer. I had a friend who was an oil consultant, a drilling consultant for oil company. So he was... He had a, um, a trailer on parked on the sand in Saudi Arabia for a, a number of years. And he said he wanted to grow roses, and all he had was sand. Everybody told him he was crazy. He said his roses were taller than his trailer was. He couldn't believe how, how long the stems grew in pure sand. Yes? That's a lot of water. Uh, oh, yeah. Really oh, yeah. And I'm sure, you know, if you're in Saudi Arabia... You'd probably grow them on the north side of your house, of the trailer, and you'd have to water, you know, five gallons a day or whatever it takes. Um, I understand Saudi Arabia has a lot of desalination plants, as does Israel. They, I think Israel, for nine million people, they said they have 120 desalination plants. I don't know how many Saudi Arabia has, but uh, it takes a lot of those things to uh, make enough water. So, okay, so, uh, so the soil quality is not as important. Now, roses are one plant that we know just can live in compost. They don't like it, but they'll, li they'll tolerate it. Because back in the 80s, I didn't know anything much about soil, so I thought the more compost you put in the ground, uh, the better they'll do. So my first rose bed... Uh, I had, I filled it with one-third compost, two-thirds dirt. Roses look fine. They grew about so high. They look fine. But when I dug a few out a, a number of years later, I noticed that the roots below about six inches were black and slimed out. I, I thought to myself, well, I planted these too deep because all these roots were rotten down here. The roses look fine. They had grown a whole new root system on the surface. But, uh, you know, in retrospect, they didn't like the compost. The compost doesn't have any oxygen, in it, so the roots couldn't breathe. So they redid a root system near the surface where they could. It was still a lot of compost up here, too, but the air was getting down about four inches, six inches. And the roots there were fine, but the roots down here were all black and dead. So uh, my second house, I did them in sand. But they all grew like twice as tall as they should have, which wasn't perfect either, but a lot taller than at my first house. So sandier soils, taller roses, clay soils, shorter roses, compost soils, even a little bit shorter than that. But they can tolerate it. So, um, you know, roses we get from other growers, this is in almost, almost pure compost. It looks okay. There's air holes at the bottom of that. It's getting air throughout the root system. If we grow roses, uh, we don't use compost. We use our 
top pot or or our ass the mix neither one of these has compost in it peat moss and pumice peat moss pumice perlite sand and charcoal in that one um, some years we use this some years we use that Right now, this has become cheaper than this. Earlier, this was cheaper than that, so it depends what's cheaper for us. Uh, but the, the peat moss prices keep going up, so. Okay, so for getting them started, uh, oh, um, the other thing to know is that roses, just like any other crop, you can't put them in the same soil twice. If they've been grown there, if the rose has been grown there for only a, a year, not a big deal, but once you're two or three years down the road, uh, the number of rose roots in the ground has increased tremendously. And if you pull this rose out of the ground, all these little dead pieces of roots in here will affect the next rose going in. Um, it won't affect any other plant not related to roses. So... I didn't know this back in the 80s, so I was, I was getting bored. I had a 50-rose rose garden, wanted to see all the new roses, so I'd pull out some every year, put new ones in. The ones I put in that were new would bloom once and then sit there and not do anything the rest of the year, whereas the original rose right next to them were just doing fine, like they always had. So it took me years to find out, but the American Rose Society in the late 80s was writing about it, the replant syndrome, rose replant syndrome. Um, if you take out a lot of this dirt and put in fresh, quote, virgin soil without dead rose roots in it, you're fine. In fact, one of our uh, good, our rosarian we hired back in the 90s, he had a 100 rose rose garden. He says one bag of our mix or top pot Every time he put a new rose in was enough to get that rose off to a really good start. That's enough soil to fill about a 7 to 10 gallon bucket. So that amount of soil, uh, it's about 8 gallons in there, um, is enough to get a new rose off to a good start even in uh, an old rose bed. I mean, when I redid a rose bed at my second house I lived at, I removed the roses and removed 10 inches of soil and brought in 10 inches of new soil. And uh, they were just fine. At my first house, I, I didn't go through that. I just replaced all my roses that weren't doing well with hibiscus plants that did fine. So, so that is concern too. So roses, now, back in the 80s, I was single, and I had taken over that job at the nursery, that my first job was to make our roses look really nice, <clears throat> because no one had taken care of them up until that time. So I started learning about roses. I joined the American Rose Society for a, a few decades and learned how to grow roses picture perfect so there's not one single problem on the entire rose takes a lot of work that does take a lot of work but I had you know really I knew I had good roses because um, my neighbors would tell me that a florist truck would stop by and cut my roses every now and then so uh, and especially uh, Mother's Day that suddenly all my roses would disappear so uh, but, you know, I appreciated the fact that they appreciated my roses. <laughs> so, so, but uh, it was a lot of work. So if you want perfect roses, you've got to be in your rose garden at least twice a week, maybe a half hour each time, deadheading. Deadheading is the most important. And then um, spraying them for bugs and diseases. So it does take a lot of work. Um, there are some times like this time here when there's not much going on, uh, winter time, not much going on either, but late winter when, it, when the rains have come up for a while, you get a lot of diseases. Um, and in spring, we get a lot of bugs, bug activity too. Now, there are some new diseases and bugs that have made life uh, with roses a little less attractive, but 
for most homeowners, it's not a big deal. I, I the roses at my own house, I don't think I've sprayed them once this year. I just don't bother to, to, uh, and they look fine. They they bloom. Uh, they're not perfect, but they're they're you know better than anything else in my neighborhood. So that's good enough for me. Uh, here at the nursery, we're spraying them pretty much every week in the spring and early summer to keep the bugs off them because generally if you're buying a plant you don't want diseases or bugs on them but once they're at your house it's not as as important but I mean at my first house I didn't want a single bad leaf on my roses and that takes work so so the main things that go after roses um, the main thing you'll see is is in early spring when the roses are growing oh we talk about cutting them back. So traditionally around the country, you cut back roses in the winter time or in late winter when the snow melts, see what's left of your roses. In California, it's always been December, January. But in the late 80s, the LA Times ran an article from someone back east who said, why do you guys cut your roses back so early when your worst weather is in the winter and it causes the diseases? So I thought, yeah, that makes sense. So now I, if I, my own yard, I don't cut my roses back till the rainy season is over. Because if you cut them back in December and the new growth comes out and it's raining on it, you'll get all kinds of diseases on those leaves and you got to treat them. But if you cut them back at the end of winter, early spring, uh, I would say late March, early April uh, when the rains are letting up the plant is full of rust disease and uh, black spot disease um, at that point when you cut them back you just clean it up take all those leaves off it'll take your after you once you cut it back it takes your rose about a month for the leaves to come out big enough that they're susceptible to those diseases again and by that time late april early may the rainy season even this year was pretty much over and and you won't get those diseases and have to treat again because when i cut them back earlier by may or june they were full of rust and black spots so and and so you can just avoid spraying if you cut them back late they'll bloom all through winter unless we have real bad wind or real bad cold um, now, fertilizing-wise, generally you fertilize roses year-round, depending on what you use. You know, some of the things you have to apply every two weeks. Some things you, you apply once a year. It depends what you use. So um, they did studies. So back east, they did studies on roses because most people stop fertilizing them in early fall because they thought the rose would go through the winter better if they didn't feed them but when they did studies in a zone 8 location which is similar to Sacramento uh, they found out that if they fertilized them year round they looked better than the ones where they stopped fertilizing them in, in anticipation of winter so you it doesn't really hurt to keep fertilizing them at all I would think in Minnesota you stop in August because <laughs> you get your first frost in September so uh, I mean, in those areas where you only get four hours of, of um, four months of growing season, you don't prune roses very much at all during the year. Yes. And you don't get it, and then you grow that bulb. Is that signal for the rose to Well, when you don't deadhead a rose, and it makes that rose hip, it a lot of times it won't grow any new branches. So, uh, yeah, you don't get any new growth which is what you, you, know, you don't want new growth right before you get a frost. So leaving the rose hips on there signals to the rose that it's done. Some roses, again, don't make rose hips and they just keep falling off, so. Okay, so when we cut them back, um, you know, there used to be a lot of rules about pruning roses. There used to be books and pamphlets written about pruning roses, but in the last 20 years, there's, you know, the number of volunteers that can do public rose gardens to help out there. 
has dwindled. People don't have time to do it. So now there's a pamphlet that's been printed on how to cut back roses using a chainsaw. And they did a study in England where they had uh, 50 roses in one group, all the same kind, 50 roses in another group, all the same kind, and they had the best rosarians in England pruning these perfectly, according to all their literature. And on this side, a machine just cutting off the tops. And they wanted to um, see how many quality roses each side made. And after five years, they couldn't find any difference between pruning the way all the books had been written to do it and the machine just cutting off the tops. So they ran it another five years, just certain that there'd be a difference, and there never was. The roses pruned, you know, without looking at the plant, just getting off your uh, your um, spent roses was as good as the best rosarians in England. Yes. Yeah, with the chainsaw, of course, though, you don't cut the, the cross chains that. No. True, but again, they saw no difference. Ten years of pruning roses with the machine versus people, they still didn't see any difference in the number of quality roses that they made. So, so you know, you don't have to follow the rules. They say, now, the, the things that we noticed. Uh, so in England, there's English roses that look like, uh, you know, they have hundreds of hundred petals on them like that. So David Austin, his instructions to his clients was, don't touch our roses for three years, don't prune them. Don't, you know, don't cut the stems out, don't do anything for at least three years to get these roses. Uh, whereas, you know, here we always get rid of the old stems and all that from day one. So what we found out, so back in the 90s, um, the Huntington Gardens hired a new rosarian that wanted to try the English method on Huntington Gardens roses. So he, he wouldn't prune them any shorter than four feet in the winter time. So after a couple of years, I went over to Huntington Gardens and looked at their roses. You know, the canes were like thicker than broomsticks easily, you know, a couple inches in diameter. The canes were, and looked at the roses, and I didn't recognize them at all because the roses that we're used to having, say, like this is double light, used to having around 30 petals. They had like 80 petals on them. I go, that doesn't look like double the light at all. It looks like an English rose now. So apparently what the thicker the trunks get, the more petals you get on your flower. So you lose the spiral look that we want on you know, the, the classic roses, which you know, have this definite spiral pattern and a high center where the center is higher than the side petals, you lose it. If you have the really old canes, they'd start looking more like English roses. This would be like the English rose style here where there's like a hundred petals on that thing, no center. So American roses, American roses that are bred to the classic American form of a spiral center, it's they're better on the new growth coming out of the at the base of the plant than they are on the older stems. So if you want the classic form flower, when you cut your roses back, you know at the end of winter or whenever you do it, you cut them short. I went, I've been to Rose Hills at the same time and all the roses were cut to about ankle height really it cut them really short there but you go there in the spring and their roses look gorgeous just like the photos whereas Huntington Gardens at that time they didn't look anything like what they were supposed to look like they all looked English now uh, there's a different rosera now there that works there that uh, worked for American Rose Company so I think he's probably got it back <laughs> Uh, normal look but um, 
but it's interesting that we that they actually did that and we saw the results so we know now what what each type of pruning causes you get thicker stems you get more petals so but not necessarily the look you want right so if you like leanless style flower yeah just don't cut them back much leave those really monster canes in there okay so in springtime uh, when they start growing, usually the first thing we get are aphids. So aphids are those little, little tiny, you know, smaller than a BB bugs that are amber colored and cluster in all the new growth and make everything sticky. Um, back in the 80s, whenever I'd spray for those, I'd come down with severe spider mites in the summer. It was the sprays we we're using that were not, uh, um, that were causing a, um, well, they, the sprays we're using were killing off the beneficial insects, and we end up with hordes of spider mites every summer. So I found in my own rose garden, if I didn't spray for the aphids, let the ladybugs come in and take care of them. You know, you'd have to be patient. It'd take till mid-April or May for the ladybugs to find them and clean them up. Now, it's not really the ladybugs that are there first. So there's uh, the first thing in my rose garden was the um, drone flies, which are... They're flies that hover. They're also called hover flies. They're, they're colored like a bee, but you can tell they're not a bee because they, they're a little small. They just hover there, and then they dive to the rows and back up. They're diving and coming back up. They're hunting for aphids, and they'll lay eggs among the aphids that hatch out into little green maggots that can slop up 20 aphids per day. So they clean them up faster than the ladybugs do, but when I first saw those things on my rows ago, that can't be what I what, what a good bug because it's a big green maggot. It's a maggot, and it's green. And you go, I don't want that on my rose, but they 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 eat a bunch of aphids, and they make little cocoons near the buds when they're done. Uh, so if you allow nature to take its course, then you rarely have uh, any more bugs. Well, the problem we have nowadays are thrips. So in the springtime, we have something called a western flower thrip. And they do damage like you see right here. So the outermost petals of the rose get sucked by thrips. And the outer petals get damaged. Well, all you have to do is, if you don't want to control thrips, pick off the outer petals and the rest of your rose look fine. But if you want to um, control the thrips, you've got to spray them. And I found that all you have to do is spray the bud itself. So when the bud just starts cracking open, you can see color of the thrips are laying eggs in there. So I would take my spray, you know, I would have a one of those pump sprayers. We had aerosols at that time too. And we found out if you take an aerosol can and get real close to the rosebud, aerosols come out around 30 degrees or so. <laughs> And it freezes all the buds. They go, okay, that's not good. So if you use an aerosol can, you got to stay about this far away to spray the bud. But with the pump sprays we have now, you just go right up to the bud. Spray just the bud so the thrips can't get in. And that'll stop that springtime thrip from getting into your flowers and messing up the puddles. Um, you have to do that twice a week for a couple of weeks before you knock them out. All the buds ready to open, spray them, protect them. So you have the aphids and you have the thrips. Uh, mildew shows up in late April on a typical year. This year, same thing, late April. And that's a fuzzy white coating that covers the leaves of your roses. Uh, now, one year I decide, well, what happens if you don't control mildew? So I let one of my roses that was highly susceptible to mildew get mildew. So here's this rose plant that's about this big, about 12 buds just sitting there covered with white mildew and a couple months later it still looked the same 12 unopened buds covered with mildew they went to open the plant was just stuck right at that spot so I go okay I just cut off all the effects and let it regrow and it bloomed right away but um, with the mildew on it it messes them up it can mess them up really badly mildew weather is between 55 degrees at night and 85 in the day and that occurs 
for, for us from late April when we get warm enough at night to uh, usually to early July when it gets too hot in the daytime. Now this year we we didn't get heat until August, so we had a control mildew a little bit longer. And this was the worst mildew. Now, I have to tell my customers, this is the worst mildew year I've ever seen. We've never had one worse than this because every grape we had, even the grapes we've never seen mildew on, got mildew. Uh, it was real hard to control the mildew with the regular sprays we used to control mildew. So this year we had to go to our tried and true from the 1980s and it worked. So we took a very clean oil. This is all seasons oil, mineral oil. And we took baking soda. So I'll write it down. So for powdery mildew, One gallon of water, and you can certainly cut it down to a quart if you don't have don't have many roses. One gallon of water, we use four tablespoons of the oil and one tablespoon of baking soda. The oil kills the mildew on contact. Mildew is a surface fungus, and oil just takes it right off the leaf. And the baking soda prevents germination of new spores for about three or four days. And so that'll take care of for the week. So once a week we did this. Now oil also kills bugs pretty good. So when we did this combination every week, the roses were totally clean back in the 80s. We didn't have any bugs on them. I mean, even the thrips going to the fly, you know, we're hitting them with oil over and over and over like that. Uh, even the thrips couldn't get going on the rose too well. So in the 80s, we were love, loving life. I mean, using totally organic products. This has got an organic label. Baking soda, I assume, is organic. It's an assumption <laughs> since we eat it. Um, um, yeah. Rose looked great, and then in the 90s, we got all these foreign rose diseases in, and we had to go chemical again. So in the 90s, uh, for the first time ever, black spot appeared in California. So black spot had always been bad trouble back east. I mean, one of the problems we have with rose, you see, is that the rose breeders were, you know, Jackson Perkins was in Irvine, and Weeks Roses was in, um, well, he was centered in, I think, in Ontario, California first. So all the rose breeders were in California because we had the great rose weather. So they bred roses for California and they sent them around the country and they were just performing really badly in the diseases. So roses back in the late 80s, early 90s, got real bad reputations for being difficult because they weren't bred for back east. They're bred for California. Yes. Well, uh, Jackson Perkins was headquartered in Medford, Oregon, but their breeders were right here in Irvine. We leased, so after we were, back in the 80s, we were um, uh, redoing our store. So we leased the land that Jackson Perkins had just finished. They, they left that area and they moved, uh, I guess, somewhere else in the Central Valley to do their breeding, or was it in, uh, I think halfway up the coast, they moved their breeding ground. But their breeding grounds are right there in Irvine. And we got on their land, there were still some roses in the ground, the greenhouses were still there. Uh, so that's where they were in the 60s, 50s and into the 60s, uh, when they were breeding a lot of their roses. Well, David Austin uh, Roses has a growing grounds in Tyler, Texas. Yeah, so they, they moved there. So Texas, I know, well, okay, so most of the roses in the United States still, I believe 60% are 
maybe more are grown right near Wasco, which is south of you know, south of Tulare Lake <laughs> and south of Fresno. And they grow them there because for two reasons. It's hot and dry in the summer, no diseases. Uh, the soil is clay-like. Three reasons. The soil is clay-like so the roots don't go down too far. So there was once a grower in Hemet, California, where it's nice and dry, but the soil is too sandy. And the roses, when they grew them, they had one root that went straight down about six feet into that sandy soil that they had. And when they sent the roses to us, they only had one root on it. <laughs> I was like, but in clay soil near Wasco, they make lots of little roots that go sideways close to the surface. So we had a better root system from that area. So they they stopped the growing them in Hemet and started growing them in uh, Wasco. And the other thing about Wasco this time of year, uh, they start getting what's called the Thule fog. So when they harvest the roses in late November, they can plumb out of ground and everything's fogged over so nothing dries up. They can take their time and, and gather these plants, bare root rose plants, and pro start processing in the fog. So uh, they said, yeah, that place is the perfect place to grow bare root anything. Bare root trees are growing there. The bare roses are growing there. Um, in Texas, they don't harvest until January when it's really cold. Uh, so, uh, but in California, they har start harvesting in late November. And then they have huge warehouses of high humidity, kept around 40 degrees, and they store them in there until they send them across the country. Those, they said they store them in there till May for Maine. So... Okay. No. So rust actually looks like rust when the disease matures. So when you get rust on a leaf, this could be a rust. Yeah, this is probably rust on this leaf. We had so many storms this summer. So you see them turn yellow like this. Then on the bottom side, when it's mature, you'll get these orange spots that are the spores of the disease that look like actual rust. So that would be rust disease. Black spot, you get these fuzzy black spots right on the surface of the leaf. That happens during warmy, rainy weather. So, uh, and most ru diseases don't like it real cold. So when we get rain in December and January and February, we don't see that many diseases. But by the time you get to April and it's still raining, black spot and rust show up because they, they need it a little warmer. Now, the one disease that really messed up a lot of growers um, in the early 90s, downy mildew came to California. Apparently, it's from China or India originally. So downy mildew, for homeowners, not a big deal. You, you'll probably never see it. It's, it's a disease where when rows are grown real close together, like in a nursery, and, there's, and the new growth is coming out in the winter and it stays wet, doesn't dry off when it's cold and wet, downy attacks. Uh, now, in a more humid area like back east, where the humidity is close to 100% a lot, you'll, it actually looks fuzzy. In California, all that happens is the leaves start looking, getting a little vague purple or gray spots. And then after a while, the whole leaf turns yellow and just drops off. So what happened in the early 90s was in these large nurseries in the area with all the roses can to can, all the leaves were turning yellow and falling off around February or March. And everybody was panicking because they didn't know uh, what was going on. And we, we saw what Heinz Nursery and when they were in Irvine was doing is they had on their pruners these little bottles of um, bleach that would sprayed the pruner blade every time they made a cut because they're so worried about it. It's like COVID. When COVID happened, everybody was spraying everything. So they were spraying everything and then they found out what was going on. They found a, a fairly easy treatment for it too. So, But homeowners, you just generally never see it because if you cut your roses back in the winter, there's no leaves there to get the disease. Um, it only happens when it's cold. In fact, Someone in Maine found out when, you know, there, the right conditions are on April or May. 
all they had to do to treat this disease was connect their hose to their hot water in, off the washing machine and spray the rose down with 120 degree water and that killed all the downy. It didn't like it warm. So here in California, so you can get it early in late in winter, early, very early spring, but if you cut your roses back at that time, it's not a big deal. You won't, you won't have any at all. It's, um, it really goes after miniature roses a lot because they're so dense. So a lot of times the miniature roses, just, all leaves turn yellow fall off. What happened? And then they grow back and they're fine. That was Downy that did that. So the rose growers hate that because they can get Downy and lose an entire couple months of growing from that, but um, they recover when it warms up. <clears throat> so that's downy mildew, different than powdery. Black spot and rust, again, if you cut them back late, you don't have to treat for it. Um, the fungicide that's best for black spot and rust is Fungimax. Uh, 20 years ago, this came on the market as Eagle. This company, you know, once the patent wears off, they can change the name, so it's we carry the cheaper brand called Fungimax. It works on all the major rose diseases, but this year it did not work on the powdery mildew at all. It was the conditions so bad, so we went to the baking soda and oil. And baking soda and oil can actually stop a lot of the other diseases too. The baking soda stops the spores from um, sprouting. So when you get, so um, most rose diseases need moisture on the surface of the leaf. So down, um, black spot, downy, uh, rust diseases, they need a drop of water sitting on the leaf for a minimum of four hours. Sometimes it takes even longer. So the spore of that disease germinates in the water and takes a while to enter the leaf and then it's bad news after that. Um, if you water your rose leaves in the morning, it's not a big deal if they drop within four hours. So um, the Portland Rose Garden, to this day, they still do it. So they found out, you know, like mildew likes uh, a few drops, small drops of water on the leaf to sit there and sit there and sit there to get into the leaf. So they found out if every morning they would turn on the sprinklers for 30 seconds and wash everything off the plants, including bugs with their sprinklers, they can spray a lot less for bugs and diseases just with the water alone. But they, you know, they don't want to do it too early in the morning, but they do it, oh, Portland's drier air than here. It's more inland, so they would spray them off in the morning, uh, and that would take care of a lot of the diseases that were trying to get into the roses. But if you water, don't water your roses at 5 o'clock in the night, because then they'll stay wet the entire night until the next day it'll get rust or black spot this time of year. So the timing of the watering is, overhead watering is important too. But watering can take off a lot of the bugs and diseases. And mildew hates water. So uh, during the rainy season you never see it. Um, the, back in the 60s before we had a lot of these chemicals, the way my dad controlled mildew is you go out there every morning and blast the roses to get the mildew off them. That's all we had was just physically removing it that way. Now with the oil sprays, it's a lot easier. Okay, so most of those disease is not too bad, but now we have a new bug that came in. Um, This came in about six years or seven years ago, chili thrips. So in the spring we get the western flower thrips that can do just this much damage to the rose, but the chili thrips do a lot more. If you look at the bottom, and the chili thrips show up when it gets hot. This year it didn't get hot until end of August. Now last year we had 100 degrees in April, so we got hit by the chili thrips around July. But this year, uh, they didn't come around much because it's been such a cool year. But you can see what damage they do. This is mild damage compared to what they can do. All the brown on the bottom of these leaves. So when this, when this branch was just growing, 
at this stage, the chili thrips gang up on the rose plant and start sucking the leaves and all that brown on there and all this damage on the outside of this bud was from chili thrips, not the western flower thrip, which hits us in the spring, but the chili thrip that gets us in the hot weather. Uh, now, last year was so bad, a lot of the, our customers told us the roses just stopped blooming. So when chili thrips are bad, all the flower buds just turn brown and shrivel up. All the new leaves just turn brown and shrivel up. And if you're in Florida, that can be May through October. Now, fortunately, there are the best control for chili thrips is organic. So Spinosad is an organic product. Um, we have Spinosad soap. We have Camp Jack's Dead Bug Brew. These are both Spinosad products. Uh, there's quite a few. There's probably three more brands out there from all the major companies that make the Spinosad product. That's still the best control for thrips we have. Um, now, the thing about roses is that new growth is very waxy unless you have a good wetting agent like soap along with your Spinosad, they may not stick at all. So, Captain Jack's without a wedding agent won't stick to a rose. Now, with I, it's it's been hard for us to get a good wedding agent. We call them spray adjuvants or uh, you know wedding agents, spreader stickers. Here at the nursery, we use one that comes in a gallon jug. It only costs twenty something dollars but no one's going to buy a gallon jug of spreading a spreader sticker but the other ones we can get that are on the market all damage rose leaves so the spinosad soap works um ivory dawn joy if you add about 10 drops per gallon of water that helps it stick better or about what's that about three drops per quart um so you can experiment because there's a lot of soaps we don't know the concentration on uh how much to use so if you don't use any soap at all you'll notice that the spray just beads up on the leaf surface won't cling won't spread out over it if you add the right amount of soap it spreads out very nicely over the whole leaf if you add too much soap it just runs off won't won't cling the leaf at all so uh, about three drops per quart or ten drops per gallon may work um, but we just I don't know we can't find a spray adjuvant on the market that won't hurt rose leaves and flowers at the moment um, the one we use is called no foam B but it only comes in a gallon <laughs> so we can order that for if you want that one but that's enough to last you for probably a decade um, we go, we go through it about once a year, a gallon of that. So Spinosad on the buds. Um, now you're not supposed to use Spinosad more than twice in a row before you start running to some, um, resistance. So Spinosad kills supposedly 95% of all the thrips on your plant, but the 5% it doesn't kill will then start multiplying and going to town. So if you want to do it organically, you do this one week, and then you do oil or one of the other oils. We sell a lot of essential oils from Dr. Earth. Use one of those the next week, and hopefully the oils will kill the thrips that the Spinosad didn't. Um, now in commercial use, we often go to a different pesticide totally uh, that's not organic, um, permethrin, resmethrin, there's a bunch of chemical pesticides that kill thrips decently. I've got one on the shelf called, they put the name 8, E-I-G-H-T on it, it's permethrin. And that, uh, will control thrips pretty well too. So here at the nursery, we'll spray 
Spinosad once every two weeks and a different product the other week. Usually it's the oil, the baking soda control, the mildew the other two weeks. And with that combination, we've been able to keep the roses pretty th free throughout the year. Um, again, this year at my house, we saw minimal damage from chili thrips. The weather was just too cool for them. So chili thrips supposedly originated in India <clears throat> and their favorite plant, of course, would be chili. But the book does say they can affect the growth on 250 types of plants. We think it's more than that. Anything that's actively growing quickly in the summer, the chili strips can affect it by warping the leaves. Uh, roses get the seem to get the worst damage. Chili's second worst. Well, you don't know anything in the bud at all, but when they finally open, then all the outer petals are brown edged. Right, right. So you, so once you once you see this, you cut off all the flowers that are affected because there's a bunch of thrips in there. So thrips, their life cycle is they'll spend uh, a week or so in your flower bud, sucking on the petals. Then they fall to the ground and pupate in the ground, and then they come up as adults and fly around and reinfect the flowers. So you cut off all these, you get rid of all the thrips in your yard, and spray all the buds at this point when they're just starting to show color for two weeks, and then you've cut the cycle. So twice a week for two weeks, go out in your garden and spray the buds so that no thrips can get going on another generation. If your neighbor has bunch of roses and they don't control trips and you might spend the whole summer doing it but uh yes oh yes oh yeah well what's interesting is we notice for the western flower trip the spring trip doesn't like the color red. My rose, red roses never showed any damage. The white, the light pink are the worst. They seem to like the lighter colors better. Uh, but the red rose, now with chili thrips, all the roses are affected by that. But the early spring thrips, the western flower thrips, seem to like the lighter colored roses best. Now there, you know, what's happened is in the 90s when the roses suddenly became known as being uh, a problem rose, uh, problem plants, the rose breeders knew they had to do a different, go a different direction. So they started developing roses that didn't get many diseases. So the, what caused all the trouble in the first place was they wanted the color yellow and roses. And there's only one I think it was called a Persian something, Persian copper, was the source of the color yellow. That rose was susceptible to black spot. So that introduced the black spot genes into all the modern roses, was getting yellow genes into them. So someone in the Midwest, uh, uh, Rad, I want to say Radcliffe, but it's not Radcliffe, it's Rad something, um, he started breeding went back to the original red and pink roses, red, pink, and white roses, and started breeding those to develop what looked like modern roses without the yellow gene in them that was uh, susceptible to black spot. So there was a, one of the, his first invention was the rose called Knockout. So Knockout... Um, is the most common rose grown in the United States, Star Roses, this company here, uh, promotes or took knockout from this, their breeder, that breeder, and started promoting it. Let's see if I get his name real quick, but probably not. Um, as the new landscape rose in the U.S. So knockout is the most, you know, they, the starter, I think Star tells us that knockout is like 
50% of their businesses that one rose. Now back in the 80s, Jackson Perkins came out with something called Simplicity Roses, which were offspring of iceberg roses. There was a pink version of iceberg. And they said they grew 2 million of those every year of just that rose and sold them across the United States. I grew them, that was my first rose I grew with Simplicity, but uh, uh, it wasn't immune to black spot. But the knockout is, we don't carry knockout here because it is highly susceptible to mildew. So most parts of the United States, they don't have the mildew problems we have because they don't have the weather we have, which is cool at night, warm in the day. I mean, if you go back east, it's the same temperature all day. They don't have the cool nights. One day it's this warm. Uh, Midwest is just too dry for uh, mildew, but they get the black spots. So uh, knockout is good there. The rose we carry, and we're carrying it this year, it's called Home Run. So Home Run is a daughter of Knockout. So one of the West Coast companies took Knockout and bred it with itself to get a rose that they can find that didn't get mildew. So Home Run is a Knockout, Knockout, Knockoff that doesn't get mildew very easily. So, so we got Home Run. So they're red roses. They're they have like 10 petals on each flower. They're not, they're nothing you would probably put in a vase, but they're in color all the time. They tend to deadhead themselves automatically. That is the old flowers just fall off. So you don't have to clean them up. Self cleaning roses. They grow about three feet. So that, that's a real good landscape, you know, because iceberg, which you see all around California, um, tends to get, you know, we get black spot on the, in the east but it tends to get more mildew if you use it as a regular rose here. If you have it in the middle of the street, it doesn't get mildew. That air circulation with the traffic stops that. Yes. Is it a uh, standard tea or Coromunda mm -hmm. or uh... Well, it's called a shrub rose. So shrub roses are just roses that don't fit in the category. So the category is the roses, so you know. When people think of a florist rose, that is a hybrid tea. They got the name because they crossed hybrid perpetual roses with tea roses uh, to get hybrid teas back in the 1800s. Um, perpetuals had the nice flower, the hybrid the tea roses had the repeat bloom. It seems the names would be the other way around, but it, the tea roses were the ones that bloomed all year. And the hybrid perpetuals had the nicer flower, and they put them together and they got the first uh, hybrid tea. So those are the regular florist roses that come one to a stem. The average hybrid tea grows uh, four to six foot tall, one flower per stem is typical although there's no rules there um, upright vase shape plant and then we have the um, floribunda roses so what the rose growers did with the hybrid teas they wanted to make them smaller and more prolific so they found uh, another species of rose called the polyantha roses, which are real small. The flowers on, we, we carry some polyanthas. Uh, we'll be carrying some. Their flowers are maybe an inch wide or sometimes even smaller in big sprays. And they stay real low to the ground. So they cross polyanthas and hybrides and got floribundas which grow, say, two to four feet tall, are more bushy. Instead of having single flowers, they usually have flowers in clusters. Still fairly large flowers, but a lot bigger than polyanthus. So let's say these are like four to six inches wide. These might be two to four inches wide. Polyanthas are like one to two inches wide flowers, and polyantha roses tend to grow like this. 
Um, so they crossed that and that and got that, and then somebody crossed these two and got Grandifloras, which are kind of in betweener. They say the distinction between a Grandiflora and a hybrid tea, because Grandifloras grow like hybrid teas, but they usually have clusters of flowers instead of single flowers on the end of the stem. The, the, the way you determine which one's which, because they're all close related, they're all so interbred that it's hard to say. So generally, the hybrid teas look best if there's only one flower on the stem, because if this rose is strong enough, sometimes they'll make a cluster of up to five. Well, it looks better if you take off the side buds before they open, because the center bud won't have enough petals on it. What makes Grandiflora is if you cut off all those side buds, you don't have one flower, there's too many petals on it. So it looks better if you let a cluster develop, there's fewer petals on the on each flower bud. So that makes the Grandiflora, well, in the, in the uh, market, labeling something Grandiflora was the kiss of death. <laughs> there's very few Grandifloras that ever became popular. So they the rose growers would rather call their roses either hybrid teas or Floribundas. Yeah. A lot of the ground floors are very tall. So um, uh, the first ground floor rose was Queen Elizabeth. Now in England, where they developed it, it grows this tall. In California, it grows like 10 foot. This thing just skies on everybody. So in England, they don't use that term at all. Just, this, if it's a multi-flower, they call it a floor abundant, no matter how tall it is. If it's a single flower, they call it a hybrid tea. Doesn't have to be. Um, so climbers just have longer stems. So like there is a climbing version of a lot of the regular roses. There's climbing Chrysler Imperial. There's climbing Peace. So sometimes when they're grown roses, they'll find a sport of it that just wants to grow long stems. And then the you know there's a climbing double delight. There's a climbing iceberg. Um, so they, they find a sport that just wants to grow and they'll just call it a climber. So most climbing roses are versions of these that just grow longer. Right, right. So the English roses are considered shrub roses. Now English roses, really the big distinction between that and a hybrid tea is most English roses, the flowers aren't upright. The flowers do this, you know, they do this type of thing where they hang to the side. Yeah. Are icebergs the trouble? Technically, yes, but we call them floor abundance. So a lot of things, they change the names on them so they sell better. So there's not very many pure roses. A lot of the hybrid teas have Floribunda or Grandiflora genetics in them. They never know what they're going to get. So the rose growers, what they do to make new roses, they'll take the pollen from one rose and put in another, uh, grow the seeds from the hips. Uh, most rose growers, in the peak of the breeding, which was probably in the 80s, uh, like Jackson Perkins told us that they were growing, I think, 10,000 seedlings every year. And usually the seedlings bloom within a few months, not many petals on them, but they can tell at that point if they had something that they would want to keep. Uh, so by the end of the year, out of those 10,000, or no, I think they were growing 100,000 seedlings every year, they would get it down to 10 and maybe introduce four or five of those to the public. Um, that's also when they started having rose gardens. Um, what they did is they coerced um, public rose gardens to have test gardens for them in those cities so they can see how California roses did all around the country. So they, to this day, a lot of the catalogs will tell you, well, this rose is good in California only because <laughs> we have the perfect, better weather to grow roses than they do back east. 
So they'll hint that way that this rose should not be grown, uh, say, in New Jersey. Um, yes. Well, there's a couple of reasons. So back in the 80s, you know, I love this. My, the best white rose I had seen in the 80s was something called White Masterpiece. And I couldn't find it anymore after like 85. Go, what happened? This was an incredible white rose hybrid tea, so heavy that the first year Keynes couldn't even hold it up. Jackson Perkins just stopped selling it. So... Yeah, and so I asked another rose grower, can you grow this rose for me? He says, sure, no problem. Well, after one year, they said, no, we're not going to get, we, they did it for one year, and they said, we can't grow this rose. So it was, it, it didn't propagate well. Uh, they said they're only getting about a 30% take on the grafts. So that made it very economically bad to grow this rose, even though it was a gorgeous rose. So that's one reason they wouldn't grow it. The other reason, of course, is if it doesn't sell, even if it was a great rose, like Jackson Perkins has one rose they call J Jadis. No one bought it because of the name. That's a strange name for a rose. So they renamed it twice to get it to sell. Still wouldn't sell, but um, like they've got one that was called uh, Compte, Compte something. And then Star Rose has renamed it Liv Tyler. I don't think that helped it much. So, uh, but yeah. So, I, so they. Right, like color magic back in the '80s. I mean, this was the most incredible rose I've ever seen. I mean, the thing was like eight inches across. But this thing couldn't even take California cold. I was just amazed. In the wintertime, I'd lose entire canes on this rose. So you can imagine, no place else in the country they can grow color magic. But it was just, I mean, I couldn't believe the size. You know, it was like that big or bigger. It was huge. But it was so delicate. So, yeah, they created a lot of roses that never, never could be sold <laughs> or never would survive anywhere. So... So Dave and Austin roses, we carried them briefly, but we haven't carried them for a while. I might pick them up again, but the, re the problem was is that because they start operations in Texas, and Texas doesn't start selling roses till January, they would only be available bare root to us at the very end of our bare root season. So now we might just do what we, we might just say, okay, we'll keep this, the two rose companies we're doing now, Star and Weeks, are the two largest. You know, like Jackson Perkins at one time was the biggest rose company in the world. They used to send catalogs to every household in the U.S., which was a huge expense. But as the rose uh, popularity started dying off in the mid-90s, they went bankrupt a couple times. So now a company in North Carolina owns the name. But I think that's about it. all they do is they own the name to sell it. But uh, it's no longer, you know, the roses are all grown here in California and sold through that distributor there. But Weeks and, and Star are the two uh, biggest rose growers in the U.S., I believe, right now. They, they're smaller than they used to be. I think they're doing one and a half million a year. But Star, with the knockout, they do a lot of roses. So. And they're, they're next to each other near Wasco. California and Jackson Perkins was there at that at some for some time too at that in that area okay um, tools you need generally this regular hand pruners are fine I mean if you've got some really big rows you'll need some lop some rose loppers to cut through the canes because they're a little thick or even a saw when you're cutting through those real old canes. So on most roses, what we say is that the newest stems make the best classic flowers. So if that's your goal, 
it's nice to cut out the older stems as they grow now on this rose you can just tell by the kind of by the color of the green that this stem this stem and this stem are the oldest and then these fresher green canes are newer so i mean when i first started growing roses i did not want any old canes on my roses so I, they'd make a whole set of canes coming out. I'd start cutting off all the old stems. Even the first year, I'd cut out the old stems to make room for the new ones. Now, the problem with that is that I had some roses that re refused to make any new canes at all. I had this Princess de Monaco, one stem, and the roses came off of that, and it would never make another cane. i go, okay, well, that's, <laughs> So I just had to live with one stem. And so some roses are very good at making stems. I had the um, Olympiad rose. Um, it make 20 canes a year. So I didn't have to have any old canes on that rose ever. It, it would just make new canes constantly. But some roses wouldn't. So you live with what you, go with what you have on that. Now, rose-wise, um, any questions on care? Now, this is uh, one of the uh, species roses, so it's not one of the hybridized ones. Uh, this is called uh, Rosa mutabilis, so it's an actual species. It is still popular, but it can be used as a climber, as a big bush. The roses open up, when they first open, they're yellowish, and then they go to this coral blush pink and then they kind of end up magenta pink so the flowers change they also call it the butterfly rose so it's still one that we get now and then uh, mostly disease resistant haven't seen black spot on it but it can get mildew that's one of the old roses um, oh well, again, um, it's nice to get the leaves wet. You can knock off a lot of bugs and diseases if you use sprinklers. Um, so sprinklers, I would say, is better. I use drip system on my roses in the 80s, but I use sprinklers on them after that. I go, okay, sprinkling them, it doesn't really hurt them as long as you don't water at night or too late in the evening. Um, and they like water. Roses really like a lot of water. However... During that five-year drought we had, 2012 to 2017, uh, we were pretty amazed because at a park near us where they cut the water back, they lost flax plants, they lost daylilies, they didn't lose many roses. We were amazed. The roses didn't look good at all because they cut the water back so severely, but only like one died, whereas they lost a whole bunch of formium or flax plants. They lost uh, lots of daylilies, um, but the roses made it. So in our textbook now, the latest textbooks, they say roses, moderate water is required. They don't need as much water as they thought, but they still like a lot of water. That's <clears throat> well, roses like a lot of soil around them. I mean, the people who grow roses in containers for the entire life of the rose do usually use a half barrel size, which is 25 gallons, which would be equivalent to uh, at least three bags of soil. So they like a good size container. I mean, a five gallon, this is maybe good for six months. They get this get too big for that. So we, in the summertime, you know, you have to start watering this twice a day to keep up with the water requirements of the plant that size. Um, some people go with 15 gallon, but even 15 gallon drought within the day. The half barrels can go a little longer than that, or a 25 gallon bucket. Now, uh, some things I've done too, I've cut roses back in the middle of summer to see if that was any problem no i did in august one year just to see if the new growth would burn at all no uh, just fine um in fact when you restart your roses 
So rose leaves seem to get old looking within six months. So in the nursery, if we have a rose that's been around for more than six months, we'll just cut it back, strip the leaves off, and it looks like spring again. The fresh leaves come out because rose leaves get pretty ugly after six months. In fact, even where, you know, uh, wherever a branch starts growing off the main branch, the rose that's attached right at that spot burns or gets brown tipped because that new branch coming out right at the base of that leaf cuts off the circulation of that leaf. So we notice that happens a lot. You get a lot of yellow leaves where branches are. If the rose plant's too dry, a lot of the older leaves turn yellow. If it's way too wet, which rarely happens, but it can happen if you're ground is really wet then all the leaves start turning yellow and the plant stops growing um, but too dry the leaves just a lot of them turn yellow and they regrow when you up the water again any questions about varieties rose I, I, I can cover that if you want we don't have to yes Uh, it's got to be economically important and they have to get paid by someone to do this so like the orange grower society or something. right and well roses they did they did do uh, for a while so back in the 80s there was um, too much rose virus going around the so rose viruses uh, affect the leaves they they get all these yellow blotches all over them and it's not a disease it's not a fungal disease it's a virus that causes that um, and in the 80s what was happening was it was spreading through grafting so if you start off with um, rootstock that had viruses in them then it transferred to the rose they grafted onto it um, and the virus can spread through root contact with the other root, root plant next to it but they couldn't really spread from bugs or or they couldn't be spread by pruning it was just in the rose itself so they had to get the viruses out of the rose so they went through the universities so what the universities found out is if they um, took a rose in a five gallon pot and stuck it in a heated chamber at 104 degrees for three days it would cook the virus out of the entire plant just like you get a you get a fever, 104 degrees, the viruses are killed. So if the rose survived that, they said not all the rose survived 104 degrees for three days. They were virus free. Then they found out later all you have to do is tissue culture them. So now they just tissue culture some roses. So if you tissue culture a rose, what you're doing is you're taking a portion of the growing tip of the plant where there's no circulation yet so the viruses have to go through the circulation system to spread through throughout the rose plant so you take the new cells dividing right at the tip of the stem there's no virus there so they can create an entire new line of roses from tissue culture um, that are virus free now armstrong roses back in the 80s started to propagating tissue culture roses and sold them I think that put the wholesale ver um, section of Armstrong out of business because they spent a lot of money on tissue culture roses and the roses that they sent us were did not look anything like the original roses so that that year was 80 something I got some Mr. Lincoln's from Armstrong they were tissue cultured you know, Mr. Lincoln, you know, you get flowers this big, you get plants this tall. Well, the first year in the ground, that rose grew about this tall, had roses about that big. Second year, about this tall, had roses this big. It's like it took three years to get from a tissue culture to the normal rose. So that that was a total failure. Uh, tissue culture acts like a baby too long. So, um, so yeah, not many people tissue culture rose anymore, yes.
that many, well, not all the varieties that you had would be available. And I think one of your better sellers last year, I think I probably had this one called Redwood or something. It was a big red rose. This one a few years ago, yeah. I didn't order it. Yeah, there's too many red roses, so we ordered some. Uh, I think we're missing one or two that we couldn't get this year. But I didn't order Legend. But yeah, a lot. The roses that were, a lot of the roses that we're missing are ones that are kind of are always small anyway. And they just didn't grow with the weather we had, so they didn't get big enough to send out. I know the, the main one, the, the main ones we're missing, though, that we hate to not have. Paul John II, which is one of the best white roses ever, not available this year. Um, Francis Mayon, which is named after the owner of Mayon de France, which is the partner to Star. Uh, hate not to have that one. That's a, a incredible, you know, it's named after the owner of the company. So. Oh yeah, they're great roses, but we can't get them. They had a so Francis Mayon is another one that's uh, just the perfect rose. I don't have a big picture. It's small picture here is this one, but the flowers are like six inches or bigger. Like, it's kind of like Lincoln in that it grows this tall, huge thorns all over it, but these monster, um, just really light pink roses that don't fade at all, last a long time and have great fragrance. So, Francis Mayon, couldn't get it this year. Another one that we're really sad not to have is Rouge Royale. That thing is this, that's a monster rose too. This one. I mean, that thing is, that, those flowers weigh a pound. It's like, <laughs> they're so heavy and they're fragrant and they last a long time. And there's very little disease on them. Just unfortunate we couldn't get that this year. It is a little slow growing. That's probably the, one of the things they couldn't get the plants up to size because those flowers take so long to develop. <laughs> Plant sits there and takes a month to develop this bud that's that big, but it's just real impressive. Well, our favorite rose, my favorite rose overall is East Piaget, which we are getting. I don't know if I have a picture in here or not. This, this company doesn't take good photos. For some reason, they, you know, they, they always show the rose at the wrong stage. This is their picture of East Piaget. Usually looks more like a classic rose when it opens. This is kind of its finish, yeah. but it's huge and it's fragrant and it doesn't fade and it's, it's not real tall. It repeats really fast and we haven't seen much disease on it at all either. So it's, it has, you know, it's like one of the best rows we've ever had around. Like if you go with Mr. Lincoln. <laughs> Eves, Eves, uh, the watch company, Y-V-E-S. So like Mr. Lincoln is one of the most popular roses in the world. And it is, you know, in April, every April, you see, Mr. Lincoln, it's like an eight inch flower. It's the most velvety red you'll ever see. It looks like velvet. The fragrance is there. Everything about it's gorgeous, but it doesn't like heat. <laughs> so in the summertime, you don't get any flowers that look good. I might have Mr. Lincoln against the hot wall and the flowers would never even open in the summer. I had to move my Lincoln to the north side of the wall so that it would, it could do something because it's so subject to heat damage. 
Plus, Mr. Lincoln can grow 10 feet tall. That's the other problem with it. But in April, you can't beat that flower. It's just, it's this huge, gorgeous velvet. You know, it's, it looks like it's made out of velvet. What's the one of the This is moonstone. So on our list of roses, we also call it an awesome blossom because this wins a lot of rose shows. Another real popular one for us. We're getting we're getting these, this, and this. This Neptune's our best lavender. Neil Diamond's probably the best overall striped rose. Moonstone is for a long time this was the top show rose at rose exhibitions because of that delicate pink edge. Um, Twenty years before this one, there was one called Pristine that was similar to this, but Pristine was known as the 30-minute rose. I mean, I'd see, I had, I had one at my house and I'd see the bud in the morning ready to open and I'd come home at night and the petals were already on the ground. It just didn't last very long, but it was absolutely spectacular bloom. That won a lot of awards in the 1980s, pristine. Mr. Lincoln, though, was the most popular rose in the 1960s, easily the most popular rose in the 60s. I mean, nowadays, Double Delight came out in the 70s, and Double Delight is still the most popular rose in the world, which is this one. Opens white, goes uh, strawberry. Pretty much. I mean, David Austin, when he was financially strained early on, he um, told people that for it was twenty thousand dollars he would name a rose after anyone they wanted to. That's yeah. how we got that's how we got Abraham Darby who is a businessman in England. Um, but a lot of these rose growers knew if they named them after celebrities. So uh, there's Liz Taylor, Dolly Parton, uh, Henry Fonda, Liv Tyler of course, um, uh, my favorite orange was Cary Grant. That was a fabulous orange rose, but no one grows anymore, so there must be some production problems with that rose, because that one's no longer available. Um, not sure. That was through Jackson Perkins, but Disneyland's got those three colors that Disneyland's, you know, orange, yellow, pink, which is a really weird combination but that's Disneyland colors, orange, yellow, pink. And uh, that rose had orange, yellow, and pink in it, which is a weird combination in a rose, but yeah, you look at that, you go, okay, Disneyland. <laughs> but they said, yeah, the Disneyland rose, you go there, you'll see those roses, the Disneyland rose. So that's available through Jackson and Perkins. I mean, Just Joey came out in England when Mr. Lincoln came out in the United States, and so the Just Joey is often called the Mr. Lincoln of England because um, it is it was the most popular rose in England, and it is a gorgeous rose too. Uh, it fades a bit in the summertime to a cream, but uh, I still remember I had a Just Joey blooming at Christmas, and the flowers were at least eight inches across. I mean, they were huge. Here's the Legends Rose. Yeah. To me, one of the, well, the Moonstone we had mentioned earlier, which was a good show rose, is also a really good garden rose. But one of the best garden roses I've ever come across is Ingrid Bergman, another celebrity rose. So that's what I consider the best. No, that's a horrible picture. <laughs> this company, again, is noted. I keep telling their sales rep, if you get better pictures for your roses, they'd sell better. The picture of Ingrid Bergman's like this, which is a, is a confused center. Normally it's in perfect spiral, just like Mr. Lincoln has perfect spiral. But the nice thing about Ingrid Bergman, it's like Mr. Lincoln, Chrysler Imperial, were the old reds that would fade to a purple. They wouldn't last very long. 
Ingrid Bergman is a real waxy petal. Not as fragrant because of that, but it still has fragrance. But the nice thing about Ingrid Bergman, the flowers would last a long time. But the way the rose would bloom in my garden made a perfect show. It'd have roses here, have roses here, and have roses here. It's like someone put this bouquet together in my yard. Whereas Mr. Lincoln, all the roses were up here. You couldn't see them. But Ingrid Bergman, it would arrange themselves on the plant perfectly. And a few roses do that. The Moonstone does that with its gorgeous flowers. It arranges them um, all over the plant evenly. So. Yeah, that's hard to beat. I couldn't get it. They didn't have them this year. So I got shorted trumpeter and showbiz both. So something happened to the crop. So, any other questions on the roses? Yeah, we can do that.